We've already talked about one obstructive lung disease. That was asthma. Now we're going to talk about the other one, COPD. What I want to do is refresh you on the obstructive lung disease in general, talk about COPD diagnosis and management, go over sort of the global treatment of COPD, and then focus on COPD exacerbations. Let's start off by talking about obstructive lung disease in general. In the spectrum of your life, there are two major time points, becoming an adult and getting old. And I use this to illustrate the fact that obstructive lung disease exists on a spectrum. But primarily, you're going to make the diagnosis of COPD in adulthood. Whereas you'll make the diagnosis of asthma as a child. Now, someone can have asthma later on in life, but they're likely to be diagnosed as a child. Whereas someone who has COPD will be diagnosed in adulthood. Now, could you get COPD younger than 65? Of course. But the idea is you have to have a combination of both genes and environment over a long period of time. And when I say environment, what I mean is smoking. Illustrated by the fact that almost all COPDers are smokers but not all smokers are COPDers. And of course, you can get COPD without smoking if you have some other form of exposure. What you should be looking for in somebody who you think has COPD is someone who has obstructive lung disease, smoked a lot, and is a little bit older. And COPD really is a combination of two diseases, emphysema and bronchitis. The normal lung consists of a bunch of alveoli, much like a bunch of grapes. They do this to increase the surface area to allow for adequate gas exchange. In emphysema, you have the breakdown of alveoli, which you end up with is not as much surface area. On the emphysema side, what that means is you have CO2 retention. With CO2 retention, you don't have any change in oxygen. So you have no cyanosis, no hypoxemia. And resistance takes time to overcome. So what you'll see is people actually pushing air out of their lungs. You do that by increasing the intrathoracic pressure, contracting your abdomen and your intercostal muscles. So you'll see an increased AP diameter as the chest hypertrophies. And because it takes time to overcome resistance, you'll see a prolonged exhalation. And they'll breathe through pursed lips. It is the combination of the pursed lips and the absence of cyanosis that gives these characters the name pink puffers. Whereas on the other side, bronchitis, you have inflammation of the airways, which leads to decreased oxygen, which leads to cyanosis, hypoxemia and cyanosis. Decreased oxygen in the lungs causes vasoconstriction. Vasoconstriction increases the resistance in the pulmonary arteries, leading to pulmonary hypertension. Pulmonary hypertension leads to right heart failure, which really means edema. And it is the combination of the blue color of cyanosis and the edema that gives this side of COPD the, the nickname blue bloaters. In general, most patients are a combination of the two. Where one characteristic may predominate, most of the time it's both. So if you see somebody who's got obstructive lung disease and has elements of emphysema and bronchitis, you want to make the diagnosis. The only way to make the diagnosis of COPD is with pulmonary function tests. And because it's an obstructive lung disease, as we learned in asthma, you'll see a decreased FEV1 over FVC. And the worse the FEV1 is, the worse the COPD. But unlike asthma, there is no reversibility. 
So you should not be ordering a methylcholine challenge. Now, COPDers are going to present with shortness of breath and maybe some wheezing. So you might think that tests like the chest x-ray, ABG, and EKG are good places to start. They are in a COPD exacerbation because you want to make sure it's not something else. And while a chest x-ray may show a flattened diaphragm, it's not specific or sensitive for COPD. While we know the CO2 retainers of the emphysema side might show an elevated CO2 but a normal pH, that's not useful for making the diagnosis of COPD in the EKGs to look at the heart. Remember, diagnosing COPD, pulmonary function tests. I want to set you up with a simplified version for treating chronic stable COPD, something that you can remember and see in a pictographic form, recognizing that it's harder. So I'll go through it the easy way and expand on it a little bit more complicated and let you read about the complete management of stable COPD if you so choose. To treat, you want to start off with a short-acting beta agonist, as needed. And what's cool is that everything we add on includes the thing before it. So you start off with a short-acting beta agonist, much like you do in asthma, albuterol. But then you do something different for COPD. You're going to add a long-acting muscarinic antagonist. This is tiotropium. You don't do that in asthma. Tiotropium is the first long-acting medication you introduce in COPD. Then you add a long-acting beta agonist, anything that ends in olol. Notice what we did here. If you remember from asthma, if you put someone on a long-acting beta agonist, they die. You must include inhaled corticosteroids first in asthma before adding a long-acting beta agonist. In COPD, you choose the long-acting muscarinic antagonist and add the long-acting beta agonist next. Only if that doesn't work do you add inhaled corticosteroids. And recently, we've added a new class, the phosphodiesterase 4 inhibitors. And if all else fails, you add steroids. And of course, you know your job is to get people off steroids. This is the easy version. Albuterol, tiotropium, any long-acting beta agonist, any inhaled corticosteroid, any phosphodiesterase 4 inhibitor, add steroids. In reality, what you're going to do is be using short-acting bronchodilators.